mendelspark.com Advancing life science research, connecting people and ideas. Welcome to Mendel's Pod. We're in San Jose at the office of Microsonic Systems and we're joined by the CEO, Peter Lee. Peter spent 10 years at BioRad as the corporate controller. Since then, he's been with uh, a couple semiconductor companies and he's going to talk to us about this exciting technology which really is a microcosm of this convergence of high-tech and bio. Today's show is brought to you by Genia Technologies, makers of integrated circuits for last-gen DNA sequencing. Biology, meet the integrated circuit. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Daryl. So tell us about Microsonic Systems. You have some exciting new technology. So the reason that we are here and the reason I'm interested in Microsonic Systems is that I believe that genomics is going to do for medicine in the 21st century what antibiotics did for medicine in the 20th century. We are on the threshold of a scientific and medical revolution. And the part of that revolution that Microsonic Systems is focused on is sample prep. Now, sample prep happens to be, for reasons that we can talk about a little bit, the, the Cinderella of genomics. Everybody talks about sequencing, and people talk a lot about the informatics, the processing of all this data that comes out of the sequencing. Hardly anybody talks about sample prep, even though, of course, everybody who does sequencing has to do sample prep and I know you've worked in the lab and anybody who's listening to this broadcast who's ever done any sequencing knows that sample prep is a lengthy and very complex project. No, I, I get it. I get it. You're right because it takes a lot of time to do that but sequencing gets all the buzz. It gets all the buzz. We're going to do for sample prep what Selexa did for sequencing. We're going to provide, and we have a prototype of an instrument, which we will show you, that will do the entire DNA sample prep in a single 2D barcoded vial, like this one. Okay, now how is that such a breakthrough? How is it being done now? So sample prep today is a multi-step process that involves multiple instruments. Typically, these are instruments that move plates from station to station, and each step in the sample prep process is done by an individual instrument. The insight that the people at Microsonic Systems had was that in order to make genomics a practical reality in the clinic, that approach simply wasn't going to work. For, you really needed to rethink the whole way we think about sequencing, and in particular, you need to think about the integrity of the patient sample. You need to be able to take a cell from a an individual and process it in a way that you can be absolutely sure that the results you get, the, the, the genomic data that you get from processing that sample is in fact the, 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 the data from the particular patient that you're looking at. So we're talking about improving quality, right? time, yes. I guess is a big thing. Absolutely. What technology is at the core of this? So the heart of the technology uh, is the discovery that was made by our co-founder and, and chief technical officer, Vibhu Vivek, when he was doing his graduate work at the University of Hawaii a little over 10 years ago. And in essence, what this was was the discovery that if you put ultrasound through a segmented Fresnel lens, you get a very strong lateral component to that ultrasonic energy. Let's take a step back. You're familiar, of course, with the Fresnel lens. This was a... An I'm invention. not, but let's say I am. Uh, well, if you're not, let me, let me refresh your memory. In the early 19th century, uh, Augustin Jean Fresnel, a, a French engineer, invented the Fresnel lens, which is essentially a series of concentric rings that was uh, designed to make the light from lighthouses focus so that that light would be visible further offshore. This is a, remember, this is the period before the steamship when the biggest risk to a sailing vessel was to be driven, as they, as they used to say, onto the lee shore. You could, you could literally be in a situation in a sailing vessel where 
by the time you saw that the, 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 the shore was uh, a threat, there was no way of maneuvering your vessel away from the danger. And Fresnel came up with this device to, to make it possible to see the light from lighthouses as much as 20 or even 30 kilometers off away from the shore. And today, every lighthouse in the world has a Fresnel lens. And this photograph here is a, is a, uh, this is a photograph of the Fresnel lens at the Point Cabrillo Lighthouse up in Mendocino County. Mm. And uh, every lighthouse in the world has based on a Fresnel lens. It's really, it's really pretty, actually. It's a beautiful. I wouldn't mind a lens like that in my house. <laughs> well, I'm sure that it's for the appropriate, uh, with the appropriate uh, budget, you could have one. Um, so these have been around a long time. These have been around a long time. All of these Fresnel lenses are based on concentric rings of 360 degrees, which is what you need if you want to focus light. Mm. Weber's great discovery was that if you segment a Fresnel lens, in other words, if you, if you now break the lens into, in our particular case, uh, quadrants of 90 degrees each, now all of a sudden the sound doesn't come to a focal point, it actually has a very strong lateral component. By lateral, what do you mean by lateral? Well, literally by lateral, meaning the, the sound in fact moves horizontally in the same plane as the lens itself. And how does that help DNA sample prep? So when, when you generate these strong lateral forces and put them into a vial, the sound actually bounces off the meniscus in this vial, and when it bounces off the meniscus, it changes its direction. So now you have countervailing rings of force in this vial which we've measured, we've measured forces in the vial like this in excess of 3,000 psi. And in fact, that's how we can shear DNA more efficiently and with much greater precision than any existing method. So, as you're probably aware, all sequencing protocols require that the DNA be sheared into fragments of a particular length. Today, the state-of-the-art Illumina instruments require fragments of about 400 bases, plus or minus. Mm -hmm. And one of the great challenges in sample prep is that existing methods of DNA shearing uh, create fragments of hu a huge variety of fragment lengths, so that of a particular sample, you can only use a very small segment of the, of the sample material which is within the range of your, of your um, sequencing protocol. And this means that you have to do a lot of, of uh, separation of the fragment sizes, and you need a large initial starting sample in order to get enough material of the right fragment length to sequence. When you use our method, you get yields of fragments which are two and, two and a half times the yield that you get with the existing state-of-the-art method, which uh, has the great advantage now that you can start with smaller samples. You can start with an initial sample of as little as 50, 50 microliters. Now, for certain kinds of sequencing, for example, when you're doing um, cancer tumors, getting these samples is difficult, and if you're getting them from patients, it's, it can often be uh, painful and, and, and uncomfortable for the patient. So being able to do this with smaller samples uh, is, a, is a real advantage. And what about time? So we're talking going from so many hours down to... Well, the, the entire sample prep process today, depending on exactly the number of steps you're doing and what instruments you have, is you're talking about anywhere from a day and a half to two days to, to do a complete set of sample preps. We, when we're focused right now on shearing. Our first shearing instrument uh, will be available uh, starting the first of the year, this coming January. And we talked to, for example, we talked to a research associate up at the Stanford Genome Center, and uh, she was preparing a whole group of samples for sequencing. And it had taken her about 10 days to prepare all the, to do all the shearing necessary to prepare for a particular experiment. A long time. We did a calculation that with our prototype 
24 position instrument, not the instrument that comes out January, but the one that comes out later in 2013, she could have done that whole sharing exercise in about a day and a half. Now, the instruments you're making to be released next year, is your market for those the clinic or is it research? Today, the principal market for these instruments is research. Is research, clearly. yeah. But the thought here is that ultimately the, the big market for genomics is the clinic. I mean, you heard me say at the very beginning that I believe that, that genomics is going to do for medicine in the 21st century what antibiotics did for medicine in the 20th century. Right. And I mentioned to you that if you go up on Edgewood Road here in San Mateo County and walk up into the hills, you'll see a large building, single-story building, that has been abandoned. And you stop and you say to yourself, so why would anybody have built a large building like this here in this isolated part of San Mateo County? The, the answer is that that building was originally built to be a TB sanitarium. But by the time it was finished, antibiotics had come along, and people were no longer being sent to sanitaria. They were, uh, they they were, were cured. They were cured. Yeah. And, and I believe that genomics can potentially do the same thing for other chronic con disease conditions that, that um, antibiotics did, for example, for TB. Now, ultimately, um, the way the instrument looks for the clinic, I mean, it could, we were talking to the inventor here mm -hmm. before we started, um, and he was, he said that he, he knew someone from a sequencing company, they were talking, ultimately, these could be married up. I Absolutely. mean, into a really simple system. Yes. For the I, clinic. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you uh, were 10 years at BioRad. Tell us a little bit about you. So I, but I, you were a, you were a financial I, side. Well, I, I, I uh, you know, everybody has to earn a living. And uh, my original training, Terrell, my original training was as a linguist. Uh, my father, uh, born and brought up in England, and my father insisted that we should, uh, as children, he insisted we had to learn foreign languages. However. He did also say... So you learned American. I, well, I learned... Uh, I, I understand American. I don't speak it. Okay. You know, it's a difficult language to speak if you start off in, in England, as you've probably discovered. Um, but uh, so I uh, studied French and I studied, studied German. Those were the languages that, uh, that you would learn as a European growing up in the, in, in the 1950s and 1960s. But my father also had another... A important piece of advice. He said that if, if the only thing you ever studied was languages, the only career you could have would be as a tour guide. And so he insisted that we had to actually learn something else. And so I ended up going uh, to Oxford and studying economics, and then I came to Harvard and went to the business school, and so that's how I ended up uh, in finance. I mean, there's actually if you want to look at it a different, slightly different way, you know, you, 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 if you ever want to understand why people go into finance, you've got to understand that if you're not smart enough to make something and you're not smart enough to sell it, the only thing left is to count it. <laughs> uh, now, you've learned a few more things than finance then because now you're CEO. I mean, right. now you're back to what your dad said. You're being a tour guide. Well, in a sense, but in a rather sophisticated uh, tourist setting, I sure. would say. Right, yeah. right, right, right. But no, the, the, to answer your question more directly about Byrad, I went to Byrad as, as um, corporate controller, um, mainly because I had this insight that although I understood very little about what the people at Byrad were doing at the time, it, it became apparent to me that they understood even less about what I was doing, and so consequently there was an opportunity for me. And so when I went to Byrad and, and, the, and the chemists who were working at Byrad, and the deal was quite simply this. I said to them, look, you're smart enough to do biochemistry, and by definition, if you're smart enough to do biochemistry, you are smart enough to understand anything we do in finance. So I will teach you anything and everything you need to know about finance if, in exchange, you teach me something about biochemistry. Now, they needed to know about finance to get their projects funded. Get their proje projects funded to get the capital equipment uh, approved, because Byrad was famous for n not spending money on capital equipment, and the scientists got very frustrated because they couldn't get senior management to approve their capital appropriation requests. 
So I basically went out into the operations and sat down with the individual scientists, got them to explain to me what it was that they were trying to accomplish from a scientific point of view, and then translated that into a proposal to senior management to get their project approved. Oh, that's great. And it worked. I mean, uh, you know, I had, I had quite a lot of influence inside Inside and, the place. and then you had just the media access to, to the science, I mean, right. uh, your own university. Well, I had my own university, but I also had, right there at UC Berkeley, there were wonderful extension courses in biochemistry and biotechnology, and, and so I, I took those uh, uh, also and gradually became interested in biochemistry. And as, as we were talking before we, we started on this interview, um, I, I realized quite early on when I was trying to learn some biochemistry, but biochemistry, in some sense, is a language. I was a linguist by training. Right? I speak French, I speak German, I've studied Japanese, I've studied Mandarin. And now you speak AGCT. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. I mean, you know, in many respects, as we, we, we talk about DNA as a language, and of course it is very much a, a, a language, a language which we are only really beginning to fully elucidate, mm -hmm. but it is a language. We're just decoding it. We're right decoding now. it. To use a popular uh, term that's an ENCODE right. project. Right, exactly. Um, one, one of the big stories here is this convergence, and we've been covering it with quite a few guests lately, this convergence of high tech and bio. And so here we are at your startup here in San Jose with all these high tech companies around us and uh, you're in, the inventor of this was an uh, electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. So um, talk to us about this intersection of life science and high tech. So I, I, what we're doing here yeah. is, I think, a micro, microcosm of what you're observing in the, in the broader community. That mm -hmm. is, you're seeing high tech and life sciences come together. Yeah. And that's what we, we do here. Tell me, for instance, are the high-tech people learning from the bio people? I mean, do they, do they teach each other? Is it about that? It, um, what happens when they talk to each other? Do they even, are they able to talk? Do they have a, a common language? I think they're beginning, they're beginning to, to talk to each other. It's, it's, um, it's a difficult process because the, the, the kind of precision that engineers take for granted is something that for the most part people in life sciences don't necessarily think is very important. I mean, let me give you an example. Uh, you'll see a little bit later, you'll see the, the ST300 prototype, which, which, which will accommodate 24 of these standard matrix 2T, 2D barcoded tubes. And in the course of going through the various sample prep processes, these tubes have to be positioned over the individual lenses of the transducers to a precision of within a few microns. Now, to an engineer, particularly a semiconductor engineer, that's old hat. Registration is, is at the heart of making semiconductors. Nothing to it. No, nothing to it. But when they look at the, the centrifuges from a life science lab... Typical centrifuge is not going to be precise to that level. So when we designed this instrument, we had to design our own centrifuge mm. that was designed to an order of magnitude greater precision than anything that was out there and available com commercially. Uh, we heard from the chief technology officer at Genia that so many, of them, they're working on the next, next generation yes. sequencing, they yes. say. Yes. And he says, so many of this is already, so much of this has already been done in the world he comes from, in the high-tech world. Yes, that's it, true. You know, and, and to the biology, the life science people, it's like, whoa, wow, that's incredible. Yes. Sort of the scaling it up and, and, and you know, that side of it. Yes. Sort of taking it to the masses. Yes. And uh, talk to us about, you know, scaling this up, not only to the clinics, but eventually, you know, I mean, you've seen the Oxford Nanopore little yes. thing. I mean, eventually sequencing could now, just go to Bear in mind that, that Oxford Nanopore has been somewhat cagey about their actual results. It's, it's still a bit high. It's, it's, it's you know, I mean, I, I, I hope that they, they are successful. I mean, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a very exciting technology that they have... Um, that they have uh, developed and are, are developing. But um, 
you know, in the world of, of life sciences in particular, reproducibility is key. And the only way you're going to get credible acceptance in the marketplace, and the reason that we're bringing out our single position instrument in January, is to put it in the hands of working scientists and tell them, publish the results, because that's the way that people will begin to really believe in the new technology. Um, so there, there's still, you know, there's still work to be done, but we're on the right path here. Now, to your point about scaling, um, I think the, 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 the important point to recognize about our particular technology is, is that the, the individual transducer, and we'll show you examples of that in a moment, the, the individual um, uh, element, the, 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 the device, is made using standard semiconductor techniques. And as you know, in semiconductors, the cost per unit of production falls dramatically as volumes increase. And so our technology is extremely scalable. In most engineering applications, when you develop a solution to a problem in a lab, you then have the significant challenge of scaling up, because very often the technique that you use in the lab simply can't, can't be simply uh, grown and still work. Something that works at a microscopic level won't necessarily work the same way if you increase it in size by 10, 100, or 1,000 times. In the semiconductor world, you don't have that problem because you can create, if you can create one device, you can create 100, and if you can create 100, you can create 1,000, or you can create 100,000, or you can create a million. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like the honeybee. In the course of its life, an individual honeybee only produces a few drops of honey. But if you put enough honeybees together and put them in a hive, they can produce significant quantities of honey. Well, the same principle applies here, that once we can demonstrate, as we have, that we can share DNA in a single matrix tube, we can put 24 matrix tubes on an instrument, as we're planning to do, and we'll do 24 at a time, and then ultimately the instrument will have a, an autoloader uh, attached to it, which will uh, contain another thousand tubes. So now all of a sudden you have a thousand tubes that you can do your sample prep in a, on a walk-away mode. That, yeah, this is a very exciting technology. And I would encourage our uh, audience to go to your website and take a look at it. You have some videos there. So you're very animated. You've been jumping out of the camera frame here this morning. And um, I mean, you, you've got a couple gray hairs. You yes. could have retired after BioRad. Um, what are you, why are you so passionate about this? What makes you so excited? Well, because this is going to change the world. This, this, is, this, is, this is going to, genomics, I've said it twice already, I'll say it again. Genomics will, in my opinion, certainly can do for, for, for medicine what antibiotics did in the 20th century. And you love being a part of that. I, I think that's really important. I mean, we were talking before we started this interview about the fact that, that today, the United States, in the United States, we spend about a sixth of our gross domestic product on health care. And although, of course, the, the, the politicians uh, disagree about how to address this problem, um, the fact of the matter is that that, that amount of money is, is is destined to grow. Why? One, because each time medicine improves people's ability to survive and live longer, um, you, you 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 create a larger market for, um, for 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 healthcare services, and and because we find better ways of solving problems of, of healthcare than we had. Look, today in the United States, we have access to health care that even people as recently as 30 years ago could not even dream about. In a way, we're victims of our own success. Yes. Okay, yes. we come up with all this new technology, right. whether it's instruments or therapeutics. It's keeping us alive longer, so there's the bigger market. So the costs are going up. Right, but and uh, you have an answer for this. Well, I, I think I, I don't know if I have an answer, but let me let me put it this way: if you look at if you look at the costs of the healthcare system, 
overwhelmingly the big costs in the healthcare system are for, for, for um, palliation and treatment of chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. That is to say, things, heart disease, diabetes, the, the, the kinds of things where all we can do is, is treat people and keep them alive and give them a, a, a good quality of life, but, but we can't cure them. Mm -hmm. the, the, once you can shift the paradigm of healthcare away from treatment and palliation to prevention, which is essentially vaccines, and cure, such as antibiotics for TB, um, it, it becomes much less expensive. And ultimately, that's the direction we've got to go in. I mean, the politicians can argue about whether or not Medicare... They need help from the scientists. They need help from the... Absolutely. And I mean, the, 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 the sad part about all this is, is that these arguments that go on in the public arena about what we do about health care don't really, I think, help people understand what needs to happen at a, at a macro level to address this problem. So what, what do you think? I mean, we're in an election year. Uh, what do you think should be the policy? Now, that, now you're getting into some dangerous territory. <laughs> I, I, all, all, all I will say to you is that, that um, if, you look at, if you look at the history of the world, one of the most important things to observe is that in the last 200 years, since 1800, the per capita income of the average person in the Western world has gone up by about 18, 18 to 20 times. That okay. is more than the entire economic progress that was made since the beginning of culture, you know, culture until 1800. And, and there's been a lot of debate. I mean, along the way, I, I think I mentioned I studied economics at Oxford, and, and, and so, you know, this is a subject that also interests me. And, and, and there's been a lot of debate about what, what, what changed. And, you know, one of the things that you hear people often saying is, oh, well, it was the Industrial Revolution. It was the, it was the invention of things like the steam engine and, 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 and those things. But, you know, the fact is that that can't be right. Why, why do I say that? Because if you look, for example, at China, almost all of the inventions that were made in Western Europe in the late 18th and 19th centuries had been made in China hundreds of years earlier and had mm. made no difference. So that can't be the explanation. And, and, and rather than to keep you or your audience in, in suspense, the current best idea, I think, about what changed was that in the late 18th, late 17th century, uh, well, the beginnings of the, of the 18th century, first in, in, in the Netherlands and then later in England, what happened was that society began to pay attention to businessmen and that it became uh, a respectable activity to build, to create and build a business. There's a very interesting book written by Deirdre McCloskey called Bourgeois Dignity. And, and she argues that that was the key factor that led to this explosion in wealth creation, starting in 1800. The businessmen got more respect and had more influence. Absolutely. That, that all of a sudden, you weren't respected in terms of you know, your aristocratic pedigree, uh, you, you weren't respected in, in respect just because of the, your, the ownership of land and so on. You were respected because you, 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 you created something. You created something by putting these ideas to practical use and delivering useful products to people. So for the presidential candidates or, or politicians, it's not about uh, so much NIH funding as making it favorable for a small business? To, 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 make, to, 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 to unleash the creative potential that rests within the, 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 the population at large. I mean, the United States has been a, an extraordinary example of a place where 
people can come from all over the world. Look at, look at our co-founder who was born in India and came to do his graduate work at the University of Hawaii. He makes this discovery, and here he is starting a company in Silicon Valley. Over he, half the companies in the Silicon Valley have at least one co-founder who was born outside the United States. And he was just walking around here. We're going to have him on the program. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Peter Lee is the CEO of Microsonic Systems. He's a fascinating guy. He's been in finance. He's been in linguistics. And now he is a big believer in the future of genomics and what it can do to medicine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We're joined now by Vibhu Vivek, the inventor of the Microsonic technology. You were hanging around the office, so we pulled you in, and uh, you were telling us your story of, of how you came up with this technology. Yes, it's uh, the technology. Incidentally, was uh, was uh, came out of serendipity. Uh, you know, it was an accident in a lab back in the grad school, and uh, you know, it's uh, it literally. You know, we uh, I took this. Uh, this uh, wafer which we were working on in the lab and um, you know it, the wafer actually cracked and uh, the crack propagated in such a way that uh, it resulted in a geometry which created this unique ultrasonic wave signature which is the core of the technology um, so the uh, there's a the interesting thing here was um, uh, the lens actually cracked uh, my my colleagues actually threw it in a trash can and I came uh, before the janitor did, took it out from the trash can, was feeling guilty. It was my second week. Uh, there I come, you know, break a wafer. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to plug it and see if I could make this work. And then we found Try out. And salvage it. Salvage it, exactly. And then, you know, it, and we found, uh, you know, instead of you doing its usual uh, focus ultrasound, it started to spin fluid. Um, presented this to my advisor. And the advisor, uh, you know, said, well, it can't be happening or, you know, we need to investigate more. And we did the, the so-called reverse engineering, ran all the computer simulations, and we found out that unique geometry really did result in a circular uh, sound field. And that basically was driving the, the fluid motion. And that's the key, really, to your product. That's now. the key technology at Microsonics. Hmm. So, so you patented this yes. later and started a company. So you're an electrical engineering uh, guy, mm -hmm. but now you're looking at this life science market, biology. And so um, wh what, do you th what do you think about that? I mean, you have to learn biology now, or? It's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the uh, interdisciplinary field is the, is the thing of the future. You know, with the analytical mindset and uh, experience you gain with electrical engineering and other engineering backgrounds, and then diving into these, uh, these complex world of life sciences is where you know the fusion of both technologies result in in new innovations, and you know gone are those days where you know you need uh, you know to be a specialist. This is more like you know you have to take expertise from one domain and apply it to the other domain. And as you see, a lot of the um, like the life sciences technologies are coming from the semiconductor domain.